All right, all right, all right. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Today is March 6, and this is episode 10. Episode 10 of our Google Hangouts and podcasts on all things Doxis. I'm Brady Volpe, founder of the Volpe Firm and Nimble This. With me is John Downey, Doxis guru and consulting network engineer at Cisco Systems. John, how you doing? Uh, pretty good. I'm, I'm hoping I'm not too jittery on this one, but uh, we'll take it as it comes. Yeah, we'll have, to, we'll have to get a tech out there to figure out what's going on with your network. So um, today we're going to be talking about the Cable Labs Winter Conference, which was uh, just this past week. Uh, a press release by Broadcom, which brings us, uh, talks about some really cool technology that I'm, I'm excited to cover today. And then we'll t pretty much be focusing on return path issues this week. Um, so Cable Labs Winter Conference, if, if you've never heard about it, never attended, it's, uh, it's a pretty cool thing that Cable Labs puts together. They have a winter conference and also a summer conference. Uh, and it, folks, it focuses, of course, on, on cable. Uh, this year we had uh, a number of speakers that talked uh, on a host of topics, um, FCC, security, different uh, key speakers. Um, and uh, this year was a, a fairly typical show. We had uh, a number of vendors, a number of new technologies there. PNM, of course, was a, a big focus, product network maintenance. Uh, Alberto Campos and Larry Wilcott and uh, Tom uh, were all speaking uh, on some of the cool technologies that were going on and new things on, on that end, John, which you and I have uh, uh, talked about often. So that, that was good. Uh, Broadcom had a really cool demo going on, which was part of their announcement, their press release. Uh, I want to cover the press release because uh, I'm going to be giving a screenshot and showing a little bit about that. But the press release was uh, Broadcom announces the first upstream diagnostic analyzer technology for cable operators. And so, so, so what this is, in cable modems, they, they provide, it provides the operators the ability to remotely detect and locate upstream ingress burst noise sources. So, so John, you and I have covered... Hold it. Yeah, hold that thought. Go ahead. So let, me be, let me be the negative person, uh, the, the devil's advocate, right? I'm on the customer side, and I'm thinking, what does this really do by looking at the upstream at the house? I mean, all the upstream funnels back to the CMTS. So wouldn't we want to just look at the upstream from the CMTS perspective? What good will it be for me to just see the upstream at the modem? I mean, the modem is transmitting upstream. So how are we looking at noise in the upstream if the signal is originating from the modem in the first place? Like, how is noise from the house going to backfeed? into the modem and the modem monitor the upstream. Like a, a perfect place for upstream monitoring would be the tap. So explain, and we talked about this, so explain to me uh, how this works and why it is good. Yeah, sure. So I, I mean, you're, you're, you're asking totally the right questions. And you know, kind of the concept here is, in general, a, a lot of times we say about 70, 75% and you know, roughly speaking, of ingress noise comes from subscribers' homes or the tap, the drop. So between the tap and the home is where this ingress noise is getting into the plant and then funneling all the way back up to the CMTS. And so when, and once it gets to the CMTS, we have a difficult time figuring out where it's coming from. What you're saying is, well, you know, how how do where's it coming from at this point? Now, if it's if it's getting in the drop cable. And going into the cable modem, that cable modem has, you know, this announcement with Broadcom, they basically put another A to D in there that can see that noise that would be coming down into the tap and into the Broadcom chipset. So we have that full band capture. And I, I actually just want to, you know, so people can kind of fundamentally understand, I, I want to share a quick screenshot with you to, to show what that actually looks like. Um, so let me let me throw this up and present to everyone. So um, are you able to see that, John, on on your side? What I'm yeah. showing on the screen. Can so you zoom it in bigger, or maybe I have to zoom yeah, in bigger yeah, on my I, own side. I think I can. I don't. Let me see if I can All zoom screen. it in uh, on my side here. Um, there you go. How's that look? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. So I mean, now so we're, we've seen full band capture before. Full band capture on the cable modem normally goes from you know like 
54 or 90 megahertz up to a gigahertz. And we can see all the signals going into the subscriber's home from the tap. And that's, that's really cool. We can do a lot of testing. Now what we're talking about here is seeing the signals going into the subscriber's home that could be like ingress noise from 0 megahertz up to 54 megahertz or wherever the diplex filter is, you know, maybe 42 megahertz. And so if, if you look at the red line, that's the peak hold line. Um, and, and so you can see where the DOCSIS channel is transmitting. That's where the red line goes up to, you know, the sort of the top of the chart. And we were on a, we were on a perfect plant. We were on like the six foot plant here. So there wasn't a lot of noise because this was at the, at the Broadcom booth con controlled environment. But if you were in a real world, real world environment, we'd expect to see a lot more noise here other than this kind of nice clean plant. So now, now sort of back to your question, I'm going to stop sharing here, um, stop screen sharing. So, so back to your question is if you had ingress noise that was inside the house, that was maybe on the other side of the splitter of the cable modem, and that's going up to the tap. Now that this kind of becomes the question, would we see that noise or not? Because it would have to go through the splitter itself through maybe 20 dB of isolation and so the noise would have to be pretty high. So that may be, you know, maybe we wouldn't see that noise per se, but you can also put these modems in DSG set-top boxes. So you would have more points in a home where if you had a lot of ingress that this, this could be still seen um, as, you know, in the future as we start replacing DSG set-top boxes. Now our, I really, really get excited about this is we also have, as we've talked about, we're doing uh, in the CMTS. We are, we, you know, we're doing spectrum analysis of all those signals coming from all the subscribers that are making noise, generating noise. So we can see these signatures in the CMTS. We've just never been able to know which house they're coming from. So the technician goes out, they start pulling pads, and they figure out which leg it's coming from. As we get these modems out there with full band capture in the return path, we can monitor those homes and we can look at the signatures of the noise in those homes. Then we can monitor the signature of the noise in the, in this for coming from the CMTS spectrum analyzer. And then we can do a correlation. So now we, we see there's noise in the head end. We see there's noise coming from subscribers' homes. We do a correlation and, and, and now the noise is not unknown as to where it's coming from, but we say, oh, we see noise in the CMTS and we can correlate that coming from John Smith's home. So rather than telling a technician to go out and just start pulling pads, we just say, hey, go to John, Smith home, John Smith's home and figure out why there's noise coming from it. So this is really, really exciting technology. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that some key, some key points here, that one, they go down to zero because we've seen AM radio cause laser clipping. So normally if that AM radio is coming in at the drop, it would get uh, padded or attenuated from the diplex filters of the amplifiers. If you're doing node plus zero, there's no amplifiers, there's still a diplex filter in the node. I've seen AM radio noise come in through the power insertion port of a node because all there is to block RF is a RF choke. And maybe the RF choke is not so good uh, really low frequency, um, uh, like AM radio at 1.5 megahertz, which is 1500 kilohertz. Uh, so the, the fix there was uh, use a power inserter on the RF leg of the node. Don't use the power insertion port of a node for power insertion. <laughs> Just to give it some more, uh, the power inserter has rejection with the RF choke. Then you have to go through the diaplex filter of the node anyway. Um, but for me to be able to see the AM noise originating from the house would be good. Uh, there's a shortwave radio at 3.5 megahertz. There's WWV, which is at 2.5 or so megahertz, which is the atomic clock. Uh, we might be able to pick that up with this from 0 to 54. I believe the polling of the CMTS MIB doesn't go down to 0. I believe it's at it's 5 to 54. I don't know that I don't think we can poll down to 0 on the CMTS MIB for you know the stuff you're talking about. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct on that. It, it does unfortunately stop at five, so we yeah. 
we, we can see noise on the CMTS down to five, but we, we can't go to zero. So that's actually a, a good a good thing that we should uh, we should we should talk about uh, in the ingenious working group putting in an ECR to lower that frequency to zero because the cable modem the the MIB for the cable modem actually goes down to zero and and this is why I was working with Broadcom in their booth because they wanted to make sure that that uh, my my proactive network maintenance application supported the modem because they use the standard MIB for full band capture and it went all the way down to zero. I had to change one line of code in my in my application to go all to support their full band capture modem. And and that was yeah. just to change my stop frequency from fifty four megahertz to go down to zero megahertz and, and it worked spectacularly. Nice. I mean the the other thing would be what is the dynamic range of the modems chipset for this upstream bandwidth capture. If I have a, a noise in the house that's say at plus ten but the isolation of the splitter is, say, 20. Uh, it's going to hit the modem, go through the modem's diplex filter, feed the A to D on the low side of the diplex filter to do this upstream bandwidth capture at maybe minus 10. Um, the, you would think that the dynamic range of this capture should be at least, you know, minus 20, minus 30. So I would still expect to be able to see ingress in the house, overcoming uh, isolation, and still showing up, at least enough for me to see it, right? Yeah, I, I can tell you it's minus 30 dBmV just based on the, the, or the noise floor that we were seeing is minus 30 dBmV based on the system noise floor that we're looking at. I, I don't know if it goes any lower than that. And, yeah. uh, you know, we, I, I had a sample of one. It, you know, it was, it was what we had on the floor. So, but minus 30 dBmV is still, still pretty good. So well, I, you think I, about it. But if you think about it, if you're looking at the noise at the house, you're not seeing system noise at all. You're just seeing the noise for the modem, yep. right? I mean, you have not accumulated amplifiers noise. There's no additive white Gaussian noise from amplifiers. It's just that modem's noise figure and noise coming from that house or, you know, down the drop line and back feeding and things like that. Right, but a, a modem in a house is going to be transmitting between probably at the lowest maybe 25 dBmV and, and as high as 50 to sometimes 55, 60 dBmV. Yeah. So if we can measure if we can measure signals as low as minus 30 dBmV, we should be able to pick up some some uh, we should be able to pick up a lot of ingress noise coming from the house. Yeah, yeah, this is it's very interesting. I mean, I'd never really thought about you know, the upstream spectrum capture at the house, but it does make a lot of sense. I mean, it would allow me to correlate problems in the head end and quickly pinpoint where may, it might be coming from. Yep. You know, it could be, could be that customer happens to be a ham radio operator at 28 megahertz. And so, you, know? you know, can't pick on the ham radio operators. <laughs> We're <gonna catch> <laughs> <laughs> we can bust out Ron Hernandez as much as we want. Yeah, well, he, he, him we can pick on absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it does, I think, hold a lot of uh, credence. Or I guess is a good word for it. Um, just one more tool in the toolbox, right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think this is this is really exciting technology. It just adds, as you said, tools to the proactive network maintenance toolbox. I think once we start to get those modems out there. We're going to see. A, we're, we're, it's just going to enable our ability to go out and troubleshoot more effectively and faster, uh, because you know the, the less that a technician has to go out and pull pads from amplifiers, and you know which which <laughs> can take down service to do that, um, and and we can just tell you know, and they're just able to know. Okay, I have to go to this subscriber's house. To eliminate the noise, that that's just remarkably powerful. So I'm super, super excited about this capability. Hey, I got another case. Um, this actually comes. This will come in handy. I'm I'm thinking in my head. Um, I don't know where else I would think beside my head. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I have an idea, but I'm not going to bring it up. I have a customer that has a, a DPON R fog set up, and the way the DPON ONTs work is they're not timed to DOCSIS, they just look for energy. And when the energy comes from the house, whether it be a DOCSIS modem, a set-top mo set box, noise, ingress, the node, if you will, turns on. So the lasers are turning on and off with internal filters very fast uh, to line up with the DOCSIS signal, but they also can turn on with noise. Now the Cisco ONTs have a squelch feature 
that says when the noise comes in, it seems to be, and I'm just calling it noise, it could be any energy, and it seems to be on more than 10 to 20 milliseconds. Well, we know that's not doxus because doxus comes in spurts. Doxus might only be five milliseconds long, maybe only two milliseconds for each burst. So if we see something really long, we can squelch the laser, and if it keeps happening, we'll turn the laser off for longer time. So that helps with houses that have noise. Now, with the modem you're talking about, I might be able to pinpoint why certain lasers are coming on more often than others because I can see the modem is actually indicating upstream noise. So you're going, to see the, you're going to see the noise transmitting also, right? You're going to, you're going to see noise from the modem. You're, you can also see the noise transmitting and correlate like that. You can sit there and monitor that modem the whole time. Yeah, so I, I could be, I could be, um, how do I want to say, that, that's a good point too is, can you, well, I mean, anytime you monitor the modem via SNMP, layer three, it's going to turn the lasers back on just to monitor. But my point is, could I be getting OBI, optical bead interference, because one house is turning on more than it should be? Right. Actually, I, th I think I understand more what you're saying is that the reason the laser turns on is because there's noise coming from that house. Then the laser thinks, oh, I need to turn on because this modem is transmitting data, but it's not really the modem transmitting data, it's noise coming from the house causing that laser to turn on in the RFOG network. So you use the, the modem itself <laughs> to, to say, oh, it's, <laughs> it's not data, it's noise, and, and that's yeah. what's causing the OBI, it's causing the yeah. laser to falsely turn on, and, yeah. and sometimes this is really hard to diagnose this problem without sending a technician to the house to say, do we have some kind of noise being transmitted out of this house causing the laser to falsely turn on and we can do all this diagnosis without ever sending a tech to the house we can just do it using this capability in the modem. Yes, yes, because right now it's hard to um, talk to the ONT and control the, the optical, what, what's it, is it ONT or ONU? Optical node, whatever it's called, <laughs> you know yeah. the node. Yeah, so that, that, that's actually a good that's that's a good concept, John. I, I had not even thought about that before. I wonder if other people that are looking at this have because uh, yeah, very good. So I think it, it actually works out. It works to my advantage. Right now, it's difficult for me to determine which house is causing the problem. Well, you know, everyone's really out working to make your life easier uh, on a daily basis. So <laughs> I know. <laughs> So, so five to eighty-five megahertz. You wanted to to talk uh, cover that, right? Yeah, I mean, the other thing you know, you and I talked about was even with this technology of doing upstream bandwidth capture, if it only goes zero to fifty-four, zero to forty-two, what about five to eighty-five? And then I thought, well, does it really matter because we still have the downstream full bandwidth capture that would be say fifty-four to to one gig. Uh, so if there's any noise at 65 megahertz, it's going to show up on the downstream side of the full bandwidth capture. So I'm still getting uh, some of that uh, uh, spectrum, if you will. So if I ever want to upgrade to 585, I know there's already noise at 65. Now, if there's a diplex filter, I'm not going to see ingress at that the no man's land of the diplex filter, the 42 to 54. But I mean, if I do DOCSIS 3.0 modem that does 585, did Broadcom mention that they would do a zero to eighty-five? Do you know? No, there there was no discussion on that. Um, you know, there is there's a diplex filter in there, and and they're doing an a, a to D on either side of it. So you as you said, where the crossover is, there's you know a very small invisibility region. But uh, other than that, it's going to be you, you're going to have visibility pretty much everywhere. Okay, so. Um, 585, you and I talked about this, and there, there's, it's kind of a conundrum. People are uh, analysis paralysis. Should I upgrade 5 to 42 to 65 European? Should I do 85 because it's in the DOCSIS 3.0 spec? Should I look at DOCSIS 3.1 and bypass 85 megahertz and go to 117? Anything I do to expand the upstream starts eating away into my downstream. So my downstream, I have to relinquish channel two, three, four, five, six. Maybe go all digital on my downstream, get rid of those lower channels. Um, 
and then move my and then my downstream might have to expand to 1.2 gigahertz to make up for the fact that I lost some downstream spectrum at the low end. So maybe I go to 1.2 gigahertz on the downstream. I do five to do I do 5 to 85? Well, the modems, DOCSIS 3.0 modems, it was really a may, not a must. So the modems that you have in the field today probably do not support 5 to 85. Um, I know the Cisco CMTS line card of 3G60 supports 5 to 85, but the modems have to be specified with the right part number, the right diplex filter, because it's still a diplex filter. Um, so 5 to 85, I, we did some math on this before. We said, what does 5 to 85 get us? And should we do 5 to 117? Does it bias really anymore? And the 5 to 85 doubles, basically, our upstream spectrum. We could do DOCSIS 3.1. We could do DOCSIS 3.0. They time share the spectrum, so it can share the spectrum, kind of bursty. 3.0 modem can burst when it wants to, and a 3.1 can burst with maybe 5 to 85 mega. That's 80 megahertz of spectrum, and potentially offer a uh, 300 megabit per second speed on the upstream. Uh, you know, how much do I really need to support one gig downstream? Well, it might be 50 meg upstream, it might be 100 meg upstream. And we can do that with DOCSIS 3.1, but 5 to 42 is a little bit tight. So expanding to 85 makes sense, but when you look at the attenuation of coax, you've just doubled the spectrum. Doesn't sound like much, but you doubled it, 42 to 85. And you know, from our own testing of temperature fluctuations on a 5 amp cascade going from minus 20 C to plus 40 C, um, instead of a plus minus 3 dB swing on levels, upstream levels at 42, we could see an excess of plus 6 to minus 6, a 12 dB swing uh, on upstream levels. So modems might have to change their transmit levels quite a bit depending on night and day and winter and summer. Um, which I think is going to necessitate potentially thermal reverse equalizers. I can't maybe justify long or ALC in you know, automatic level control or gain control on the upstream in all the amplifiers, but maybe we have to rely on maybe some thermal reverse equalizers to help control some of this. Um, as far as the modem swing up and down, I'm not worried about cold days because the modem will see less attenuation and just turn its levels down. That's really not the problem. The problem with that, though, is if we don't use thermal EQs, if the temperature gets cold, there's less attenuation, that means your noise floor comes up also. So I'd still want my thermal EQs to actually induce more loss to get rid of the noise floor and keep the modems almost the same level they were before. So there's some concerns, you know, about 585, and that was just a couple things, right? What about what we were calling ADI? adjacent device interference. You know, all the, the CPE in the U.S. today, a lot of them have filters that start at, say, 54 megahertz. Uh, the TV sets that you have, if it's not a high-definition TV, flat plasma, and all those, uh, which are basically like monitors now, right? If you have older TV sets, uh, they have a TVIF, intermediate frequency, 41 to 47 megahertz. So if I have a modem transmitting 50 dBmV at 45 megahertz, and it back feeds into my TV set, it's going to cause ADI, adjacent device, device interference. So from our own testing, we've shown that the port-to-port -port isolation on taps might be enough to not require filters to my neighbor's house, but I might require filters inside my own house so that the modem doesn't transmit at high power and high frequency and overload my other CPE in my house. So ha haven't we looked at, um, at at that as being an exclusion band for you know at least DOCSIS 3.1, but you know you're talking even if DOCSIS 3.0 modems that we would have to have the IF band of the TV sets that that 44 megahertz IF region um, being a, an area where we just say okay DOCSIS 3 modems DOCSIS 3.1 modems we can't have those transmitting in there. Um, you know, if, if you have a modem or if you have a DOCSIS 3031 modem, that is a home gateway, which means the coax cable that comes into the house terminates into the cable modem or home gateway itself, and, and those RF signals do not run anywhere else in the house. That might be a situation where we don't have to worry about it. However, if, if that's not the case, if you have RF signals going throughout the house, 
then we really need to, to make sure, as, as what you're saying, that those RF signals do not go into the set anyone's TVs or other devices that, that could destroy the, the internal networking, internal operation of those devices. So we create an exclusion band, a region where no RF signals you, you, transmit. Yeah, you could potentially say, let's avoid 41 to 47 megahertz. But then you might also say, well, what about just the power load? Meaning if a modem is transmitting 50 dBmV, overcomes 20 dB of isolation, it's at plus 30. Even at, say, 55 megahertz, it's outside my TVIF, but will that cause a problem? You know, is there too much uh, power into my set-top boxes, into my TV sets? Um, so it might even require that I just filter out every above 42 um, on the splitter that, that separates my TV, what do you want to call it, my house network versus my high-speed data network. So I mean, this is the same concept of like you know putting too many oh. RF channels into a cable modem, even though it's not the DOCS's cable modem channel. It's just too much RF energy. You're overdriving it. So and you're yeah. saying it's the same for a TV, even though it's not centered at the IF frequency. If you put too much RF energy in, it's still too much RF energy. Yeah, yeah. Who's who's to say you know we don't come in at 55 megahertz and the second harmonic isn't created at 110? Um, you know, there, there's who knows what's really going to happen with some of these devices. Uh, and, and those were a couple little things. The other one was if I do 585 megahertz and you decide to do DOCSIS 3.0 four channel upstream bonding, and some of your modems support 585, but I only do four channel bonding. Other, the, other modems do 585, but eight channel upstream bonding. Other modems have a built in filter of 5 to 42. So now you have to make DOCSIS restricted low balance groups to steer the modems to the proper bonding group because if they lock on to one upstream frequency and low balance tries to move them to the other group, they might not work because their internal filter doesn't allow it to. Wouldn't they go into a partial mode if, you know, if say they tried to go to that other, load, that other group, um, they would just lock to the, or, or they would range and register to the the upstreams that they were able to and then go into partial mode to the upstreams that they were not able to. So so let's suppose your your second four channel bonding group, the first upstream channel was at forty megahertz. A normal DOCSIS 3.0 modem would be able to tune forty megahertz, but he would try to then say let's bond forty, forty six point four, fifty two point eight and uh, 58 point whatever, you know, 6.4 megahertz apart. And he wouldn't be able to do it because his internal filter wouldn't allow it. So he didn't even register fully to even be considered partial mode. So what could happen is he could end up just dropping to, uh, it might be W online for downstream bonding, but his upstream might be just single channel. Right. Here's a case Which where is... I'm better off just steering him to the first four frequencies so he bonds with the first four frequencies. Right, because in single channel, his speeds are going to be so limited in the upstream, it's probably going to limit his downstream speeds at that point. Correct. And he's going to starve everybody else out on that same upstream channel. Yeah. And then, and then he's going to affect load balancing for 2.0 modems. Sure, that makes sense. I'd never considered that before. So, yeah, so 5 to 85 becomes a, a big challenge. Uh, and and the, the cost... Just the the the, the capex and opex cost associated with doing the migration of five to eighty five megahertz is is enormous. W one of the things that I struggle with, and and is if you're going to do an expansion, if you're going to do a migration to five to eighty five megahertz, it, it's really hard for me to imagine that you wouldn't go beyond five to eighty five megahertz because you're you're upgrading your nodes, you're upgrading your amplifiers, um, and you're rebalancing your plant. That's a huge investment. <laughs> I agree. So then the question comes, should I bypass 585 and go 5 to 117? Uh, if I do, do I have to worry about that attenuation issue I already brought up? It's even worse, right? You're going to 117. Do I, you know, 585 made sense from the beginning because it blocked out a FM radio. FM radio, 88 to 108. So that's like perfect for a DOCSIS 3.0 split of 585 and downstream 
we used to say 105, I think we're now saying 102 because legacy set-top boxes have a control channel that can set at, I think, 104 or 103 megahertz. So we had to make our Dybex filter just a little bit tighter. So instead of 85 to 105, we had to pull the high side down a little bit so downstream legacy set-top boxes could still talk. And so, um, so you might see an 85-102 split now. So if I do a 5 to 117, what happens to your millions of legacy set-top boxes? They don't work anymore. Do you understand? Right. So, so, so now the cost becomes, now, now it's not just the cost to upgrade, but it's the cost to replace all the set-top boxes out there. Correct. Correct. If it wasn't for money and money wasn't an object, we'd all do fiber right to the eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so this, I mean, it's definitely a, a lot of uh, challenges for cable operators when they're facing this dilemma of do I go to 5 to 85, do I go beyond 5 to 85, and I, I think you're kind of outlining some of the challenges that they're, they're dealing with on a daily basis. I was just thinking one more. What if you're doing baseband digital reverse? and you're digitizing the upstream in the fiber node. You know, to do Nyquist sampling yeah. at higher frequencies is more difficult to do. Well, we have an EDR now, um, Enhanced Digital Return, I think it is, that will do 5 to 85. So we are digitizing 5 to 85. But to go to 117 makes it even more difficult. Oh, the cost for an analog to digital converter to do 117 megahertz has got to be astronomical. If, if it yeah. exi I'm sure it exists, but it's yeah. not... Yeah, money, Not right? Not possible to do in a node. It's yeah. just money. <laughs> <laughs> it's not your money. It's not my money. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I look at is what if we do remote phi? What if we take the frog, you know, the, the upstream chipset and the downstream chipset and put it in the node? Well, if I put it closer to the customer out in the field, 5 to 85 megahertz looks pretty compelling. I mean, it's doing it right there on maybe four different legs. So I'm doing 5 to 85 right at four different legs of the node, and I can offer a pretty decent speed on uh, of a segmented four ways at the node. And I'm doing it right at the node. And because it's already digitized, now my digital link is not doing baseband digital return where I'm sampling and running it back at digital then then turning it back to analog. I'm doing it. I'm demodding it all right there in the field. And then I'm running an easy one to two gig link back to my head end, back to my CMTS. Yeah, and that, I mean, there's a lot of companies that are looking at that. It solves a lot of problems with the analog laser in the return, which we all deal with laser clipping at one time or another, so there's a lot of good reasons for doing that. Yep. So. Okay, anything else you want to cover today? Uh, I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 585, upstream, it seems like this topic will never go away. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, what, one of the other things that was discussed that was uh, pretty interesting at, at the Cable Labs Winter Conference was security. There was a, a really good session on security. You and I have talked about security, so I think the next uh, 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 hangout that we're going to do, I think we should cover security. So we, we've talked about that, and uh, we'll schedule that probably for in the next month. Um, I would like to thank Cable Labs. They did a great job at uh, this, this year's Winter Conference, and I'd also like to thank Broadcom. Um, uh, they we, we had a great uh, display doing uh, the return path uh, upstream spectrum analyzer and their modem and uh, had, a, had a great booth, great turnout. So uh, the conference was great and, and everything was good there. So, uh, John, thank you for your time today and uh, your, your input on, on the Hangout. Good talking to you again. You too. All right. All we'll right. talk to you later. Bye, all. Bye-bye.